thank you for having me. Um, yeah, first off, I want to thank uh, Ted for inviting me to speak. Where, 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 are, where is Ted? Is he here somewhere? He's not here yet. Okay. All right. He's on his way. I'm not sure I've actually told. met him in person. I've mostly emailed. But uh, and actually, really, the genesis of, of me being here to talk, I think, uh, is thanks to Zach, who just arrived. Hi, Zach. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, know Zach Weinstein. 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 Uh, who who gained some fame uh, uh, this uh, early this winter for the discovery of a very rare bird. Some of you may have heard about the uh, uh, was it the Couch's kingbird. Yeah. yeah. How many of you guys looked for that bird or found that bird? Two different questions, I guess. Okay, a few of you. A few a few dedicated bird watchers here. Um, that was exciting. It was the first record for New York State, and people came from Massachusetts and from D.C. all over to see this yellow-bellied little bird that was perched on a fire escape uh, in the West Village. So, you never know what you're going to find out there. It's pretty exciting. Um, and, uh, and that actually ties in nicely with the, the theme of my, my talk tonight. Um, I think for a lot of people, the thrill of bird watching is the excitement of finding something unusual. But uh, I think, um, you know, of course, the topic of my, my talk tonight is red-tailed hawks, and I think they tap into some other part of us. It's not so much the thrill of seeing something unusual, because, you know, once you've seen a red-tailed hawk, you've seen a red-tailed hawk. It's not like the Couch's Kingbird, from, which is from northern Mexico. Um, the red-tailed hawk's actually a fairly common bird, very common bird, really, um, and there's quite a few of them around New York City, but uh, there's something about red-tailed hawks that taps into, I think, our our hunger for a connection with the wild. They seem so truly wild. Um, and people just just don't seem to get tired of it. I mean, they can watch the same, I'm sure some of you know, they can watch the same individual hawks uh, day in and day out, uh, whether in person or on webcams. And I want to say right off the bat, um, uh, as, as you heard, I'm a tour guide, I'm a storyteller, I'm an environmental educator and urban ecologist. Um, I, I am not, however, a red-tailed hawk expert by any means. I have not studied hawks specifically. I studied a species of thrush for a few years, uh, the Bicknell's thrush in Vermont and the Dominican Republic. Um, that was that was my short short-lived uh, attempt at being a field scientist, and I realized all those punishingly early mornings and all that hiking stuff wasn't really for me. Um, so yeah, I'm not really a, a scientist per se, and now I'm focused more on education. Um, uh, so yeah, I haven't done hawk research, uh, and I, I don't even follow the hawks as closely as, as probably many of you do. Um, I was actually almost a little nervous about giving this talk, because I'm like, I'm pretty sure half the audience is going to know more about the Washington Square and Thompson Square Park red tail hawks than I do. I'm, I don't claim to be uh, an expert. Um, anyway, so I'll, I'll give that caveat. And in fact, I'm gonna, uh, I'll probably talk for, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, and then open it up for questions or stories or anecdotes. I think the, top, the hawks may have influenced or touched or impressed a lot of us. We might have, you know, crazy stories of our hawk encounters or things we've seen and that are meaningful to us, and I thought it might be nice to share a few of those. So you can start thinking uh, what your favorite hawk encounter has been. Um, okay. This, we tested this out and it was working before they the talk. Okay. Could be a battery issue. See, there's a special button on this remote that actually um, blacks out the screen. And that is what is currently in effect. Yeah, except I tested it out like five minutes ago. It's annoying. Check the projector. Nice. Gabriel Willis. Nice to meet you. Projector. Could be the projector's gone to sleep. No, projector's projecting. That's annoying. Does it have a power button? Ah, it's not on. Oh, that's the that's the laser. I want to do that. Like this one. Let's see. Ah! Good thing. Good thing Ted arrived. Ted, everybody. Thanks, Ted. <laughs> Making this all possible. Ah, there we go. Where were we? How did you do that, Ted? Magic. Oh, is, that, is that a power button over there? Okay. Yeah. No. Not my remote. <laughs> so, 
Now we can start. Thank you. <laughs> so yes, Fred Dalehawk's Ambassadors of the Wild is what I decided to title this. It just came to me. Yeah, thank you. Um, and again, I'm Gabriel Willow. I call myself. Yeah, I, I like the adventure some fonts, and it, I decided to call myself an urban nature explorer. That's not my usual title, but I was like, this looks like Indiana Jones or something. I'll make it sound. Uh, okay. I, I don't know who to credit this uh, picture to, but it's an incredible, incredible image. Uh, fantastic. Um, so red tail hawks, as I alluded to, are really a common bird, very common bird. Um, they're in the category of least concern globally, which means it's like the opposite of endangered, abundant. Uh, probably the most successful raptor in North America. Um, peregrine falcons are slightly are more widespread globally and even in North America, but red tail hawk numbers are much higher. They're a more common bird. Um, so they're found throughout the continent. Um, they could really, uh, uh, just as easily as the bald eagle, be our national bird, I would say. I mean, they're exclusively found in North America and some of Central America and the Caribbean. So actually, I guess the bald eagle's a little more apropos because it doesn't go as far south into Mexico and it's not found down in Central America the way the uh, red tail hawk is. So you can see the, the dark green is breeding only and the lighter green is year-round. So that means they do breed even where it doesn't say breeding, but they're also wintering there, which they're not in the dark green. So the populations from the dark green area retreat southward. So some of the populations are migratory, and some are resident. Uh, here in New York City, you can see that we're, uh, we have a year-round population, but it might be augmented in the winter by birds from, say, Maine or Vermont that are coming south. So the population does seem to go up in the winter around here, when our resident birds are joined by their cousins or whatever from up north. Um, and this really shows what a remarkably adaptable species this is, because if you think about it, uh, conditions in Alaska are pretty different from, you know, the Sonoran Desert, or Cuba, or Panama. Well, actually, it looks like it doesn't quite make it to Panama. What would that be? Nicaragua? Nicaragua. Um, or the Pacific Northwest, or California, and so on. So, almost every habitat in the U.S has red tail hawks. There are red tail hawks in deserts. Uh, if you went to the Sonoran Desert outside of Tucson, you'd see red tail hawks, very common there. There are red tail hawks in the forests of the Pacific Northwest, or the boreal forests of uh, Eastern Canada or Maine. Uh, there are red tail hawks out in the Great Plains and prairies in the Midwest. And there's red tail hawks in cities. Uh, yeah, oh, really? Okay, so no. I knew you guys would... You, please, if there's anything here that you recognize or want to uh, fill in on, you can tell. So apparently it's on 84th Street. Cool. On somebody's fire escape. Um, so Red Tail Hawk, just a little background. Again, for some of you guys, this might be basic elementary. You might already know it, but a little recap. Um, Red Tail Hawks are a type of buteo, or budio, or budio. You say tomato, and I say uh, uh, This is a genus of hawks. Um, somewhat confusingly, in Europe, these are known as buzzards. The original term for these hawks is buzzard. Um, so there's a common buzzard, which fills the same ecological niche as the red tail hawk, which is in England or France or wherever. Um, there's a honey buzzard, that's a pretty cool critter, um, and some other buzzards over in Europe. Uh, when Europeans came here to uh, North America, for some reason they transferred the name buzzard to our vultures. Go figure. Anyway, not to confuse you further, but that's why it's nice to use Latin names sometimes, scientific terms, because they're less mutable than the common names. So, Budio is the scientific name for the genus that red tail hawks are in. Um, I didn't know I'd have a nifty laser pointer here, so I did that in the slideshow, but I can also, ooh, there we go, but I can do this too. Yeah, there we go. Um, so the other, uh, some of the other categories of raptors are uh, falcons, which are actually not related to hawks. They were thought to be, but uh, recent genetic analysis shows that they're basically really fast, really vicious parrots. Um, yes, their closest re relatives are parrots. Go figure. Um, if you think about it, there's some morphological similarities. Parrots, like falcons and hawks for that matter, have hooked beaks. Um, they have strong grasping feet, although without the very sharp talons. Um, and I guess, you know, evolutionarily, uh, it wasn't that much of a stretch to take those adaptations and uh, adapt them to tearing flesh. Or maybe it was the other way around. Maybe a falcon actually evolved into something that likes to eat fruit and nuts. I'm not sure which one uh, came first. Oh, hi guys. Um, and then uh, another common group of hawks, these are actually called the true hawks. In Europe, where they call budios buzzards, 
the ones called hawks are the center group, which are called occipiters. Um, and uh, the most common ones around here are coopers and sharpshin hawks. There's a lot of those. Goshawk, very rare, uh, kind of a big deal. Oh, in terms of the falcons, um, you could see any of these. Paragon, uh, rather, Jeer falcon's very rare, arctic bird. Uh, there was one up at, uh, in Wallkill, New York this winter. It was a huge deal. Um, but peregrines nest all around the city. Uh, Merlins pass through in migration, and, and kestrels actually are probably the most abundant raptor in New York City. There's maybe 200 or more pairs nesting around the city, mostly in rusty uh, cornices of buildings that have holes in them. Um, I'm not sure if any exhibitors nest here. I suspect some Cooper's hawks might in Greenwood Cemetery or maybe Pelham Bay Park, but more around the outskirts of the city. They like to have a bunch of forests around. Uh, and then of the Budios, I think the red tail is the only one nesting here, but at other times of year you can get red-shouldered, um, broadwing in large numbers during migration, and rough-legged in the winter. This is a western species, we don't have swains and sock. So uh, what I want you to notice about the Budios as opposed to these other two groups, very broad wings and tails, rounded tail, rounded wings, very broad, pretty long wings. Uh, exhibitors have long narrow tails and short rounded wings, and falcons have pointy wings and long uh, sort of Rectangular tails. They have almost like a rectangular, very robust body, but very pointed wings. Um, Burios have these adaptations, the broad wings, the broad tails, for soaring. And they primarily hunt visually. Um, well, I guess all the raptors hunt visually, but they, they are often soaring very high up, and they're scanning for uh, typically rodents. Uh, you know, it's ironic. I, I said rodent on the slide, and then I put a rabbit, which is a lagomorph. If there's any uh, mammal specialists here, please don't uh, get mad. Um, but rodent-like creature. Uh, also squirrels, rats, you know, you know what rodents are. Um, they will take birds, though, uh, especially in New York City where there's an abundance of a certain uh, medium-sized bird that's not very alert or fast on the ground, uh, that you can see in this picture here. Uh, this is a young red tail. I'll tell you a little later how you can tell it's a young bird, a bunch you probably already know. So, um, how do you know you have a red-tailed hawk? I mean, this is a good place to start, right? You know your red-tailed hawks. You know the red-tailed hawks in Washington Square Park or Tompkins Square Park. But if you're out elsewhere and you're not sure if there's a bird soaring high overhead, how many of you guys, have anybody here ever been to a hawk watch, either at uh, the castle in Central Park or out at Hawk Mountain, Pennsylvania? Anyone? No. Cape May, New Jersey? Well, it, I, for everybody else, the other... Uh, 55 people. I, I recommend it. It's an incredible experience. It's where there's counters, people counting the thousands of hawks streaming overhead. I'd say the best, well, the best two nearby are either Cape May, New Jersey, I mean, it's not terribly close, but within three hours, or Hawk Mountain, Pennsylvania, uh, which is also about three hours away, either south or west, respectively. And you can see hawks by the thousands, and it's something you'll never forget. Mm. The really amazing thing, though, is these counters are standing there, uh, and they'll spot a dot on the horizon, and they'll call it, you know, they'll be like, oh, red tail, uh, peregrine falcon, bald eagle, you know, like, and you're like, what, what, where, uh, you know, and it's like, you haven't even seen it yet. Um, so it's, it's amazing, and, and um, a lot of it's by shape. Uh, the, those broad wings, the broad tail, and the aspects of how they fly. Um, some other things to look for are, well, of course, on the adult, if you're close enough to see color, there's the red tail that they're named for, that's pretty distinctive, but you should note, on a young bird, they do not have red tails. The young birds have tails that can be white or brown or gray. They typically have narrow, very narrow stripes. You can see the, oh, that's the magic kill switch. Um, on this younger bird here, the tail's starting to turn reddish, but it has all these little bands on it. Uh, the bird over here, it really is no red in the tail at all. This actually is the most important field mark of all, that dark right there. That dark line on the front of the wing, it's called a patagial patch. And uh, the patagium is the sort of front, I guess, bicep, more or less. That is, is unique to red-tailed hawks, and they have it at all ages. You can see it on, uh, sorry, you can see it on the young bird right there. You can see it on this bird. This one, it's not noticeable only because this is a dark morph. Red-tailed hawks can occasionally come in a dark, all dark brown morph. Much more common out west. Very, very rare in the east. I've never seen one in the east. Um, I don't think very many people have. So don't worry about that bird. Or that bird. Or that bird. <laughs> but if you're out west, you might have to worry about them. But anyway, on all the rest, you'll notice these dark marks in the front of the wing. That's unique to these guys. Uh, oh, and you can tell the young from the adults not only by the tail, but by the eye color. 
You'll notice this young bird has pale eyes, so does this one. The adult, it's dark. Uh, here, these two look kind of similar, but only, I think, because this one's eye is in the light that makes it look lighter. This one's eye is in shadow. But uh, the young can have quite pale, almost white eyes, and the adults always have brown eyes. So if for any reason you can't see the tail on a porch perched bird or something, you can look at the eyes. And that's true for most hawks. I have no idea why. Uh, oh yeah, there's the patagial patch again. So the other hawks to look out for, I already mentioned some of them. Here's some closer looks. Sharp-shinned hawk, uh, one of the occipiter group. It's the ones with the long tails and the short wings. And a very different body shape, kind of tiny head. Again, that long tail, very slender. And this bird's tiny, too. It's a, a foot long. It's about the size of a blue jay. Yeah, and they, uh, these true hawks, these occipiters, is the genus, eat other birds almost exclusively. So while a red tail will take an unawares pigeon or robin every now and then, these guys specialize in birds. And they're not soaring high overhead, which is why they don't have those long wings. They uh, hunt like cats. They hide in the forest, and then they burst out and use a short burst of speed, pursue smaller birds and grab them. They can actually catch birds up to their own size, so a sharp shinned hawk could take down a blue jay. Um, there it is. And then this is its bigger cousin, the Cooper's hawk. Can't really tell in the picture that it's a bigger bird. Maybe you can get a sense, though. It's a little more robust, more powerful, bigger head, proportionally. Um, these birds are a classic identification challenge. If you get more into birding, as opposed to maybe, you know, I don't know how many of you guys consider yourself, well, why not, another show of hands. How many folks here would consider yourselves bird watchers? How many, uh, how many of you consider yourselves bird watchers outside of hawk watching? You know what I mean? Like, we don't just watch the red tails. Okay, cool, right on. Um, but you're all hawk fans, obviously, because you're here. Um, so this is a classic birding challenge. If, if you're just starting out, you know, I've seen arguments break out on Facebook or whatever with a picture of one of these that somebody took. Like, is it a Cooper's? Is it, you know, friendships have been uh, uh, lost over this. So um, don't, so yeah, don't worry about it if you can't tell these apart for a while. It's really challenging. But uh, just real quick, this guy has a proportionally bigger head with a more capped appearance. Um, Stronger legs and feet, and a graduated tail. Tail's kind of rounded. This guy has a squared off tail. Um, so, but yeah, very subtle stuff. But overall, easy to tell from red tails because that long, long tail, narrow body, small head proportionately, and short wings. Um, this is in the same genus as a red tail. So now we're looking at another Buteo, or Buteo, or Buteo. Um, this is the red shouldered hawk. There's the red tail and the red shoulder. These I've seen. Eh, somewhat regularly, especially near water uh, in Prospect Park, Central Park, um, Pelham Bay Park, etc. But they don't nest here, so they're not nearly as common as a red tail. They're smaller, and you'll notice this really strong uh, black and white patterning, these black and white stripes in the tail and the wings. That's really different from a red tail. And this strong barring all the way down the underparts. And also the red shoulders, which you can't really see in this picture, but they're there. Um, so it's a kind of different looking bird. It's only maybe 75% of the size of a red tail, three quarters as big. Red shouldered hawk. Okay, so red tail, um, if it's in flight, you've got the patagial patches. Uh, if it's perched, hopefully you can get a look and, you know, see if it has red tail, then it's an adult. Um, it doesn't have that strong black and white barring on the tail that the red shoulder has. Even the young that do have barred tails, it's a subtle, thin, striping, very different. So, so once you've got yourself a red tail, and chances are, if you see a big hawk, it is a red tail in New York City. You know, uh, statistically speaking, that's probably what it is. Uh, in fact, a lot of people, they're so big, they're the biggest uh, of our hawks. A lot of people think they're eagles. I've had people see them and be like, oh, I saw an eagle in, you know, in Tompkins Square Park. And I'm like, yeah, you, you probably didn't. I hate to bring it to you. I'm pretty sure you did not. Not impossible, but highly unlikely. Um, so you can even tell males from females, only if they're sitting together. Um, this wonderful photo is by uh, Laura Goggin. Is she here tonight? I don't know. She was, uh, that, you're Laura? Hi. I love your work. Thank you. Uh, yay. Yeah, hand for Laura. Thank you. If any of you are Hawk blog followers, and I suspect some of you are, uh, Laura has a wonderful blog uh, chronicling the, um, the red tails of Tompkins Square Park. And uh, what's your URL again? It's Goggin Photography. Gogginphotography.com. Yeah. Great. Um, but it's more than just uh, photos. There's also you know, anecdotes and accounts of the hawk's behavior and what they're up to in day-by-day -day stuff. It's really great. Um, so that's where I stole this from. Uh, even though I wasn't supposed to do that, I figured out how. I took a screenshot. Um, you didn't make it easy, though, Laura. Uh, so uh, 
red, red tail hawks, males and females, look identical, except for their size. So if you just see one bird soaring or perched, there's no way to tell. Except maybe with a lot of experience, if you recognize that bird because you've seen it with its mate. But when you see them together like this, uh, it's, the, it's fairly evident. And unlike a lot of animals, the females are actually larger than the males. Females are typically about 25% bigger. Uh, and that's true with most birds of prey. Falcons, too, even though they're not related. Uh, owls, even though they're not related. Um, all, the female's always bigger. Um, unclear why, except they probably do more of the care for the young, and that way they can catch more prey. And then you might say, well, then why wouldn't they both be big? Because then they could catch, you know, more prey. And it probably has something to do with uh, what we call niche partitioning. So they're not competing for the same food. The male might be more likely to go after something like a pigeon, and the female might be more likely to go after a rabbit or something like that. So that way they can specialize in slightly different prey and catch more. That's one theory. We don't really know. That's what I like to call a just-so story in ecology. It's where <laughs> there's not really a, that much of a way to test it. Although you could actually observe what they bring to the nest. And in fact, those of you who are glued to those webcams, check it out. See, maybe uh, once they start feeding their young, uh, which should be in a few weeks, I guess, um, but you guys can update up on that. Oh, now, already? Oh, no, 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 please. Oh, oh, okay, different way. Right, it depends on where you are. If you're looking at California and Mexico, they already have young. Um, it's like, you know, you can get tomatoes uh, from Mexico right now. You can get baby hawks anywhere, <laughs> thanks to the internet. It's great. Um, anyway, wh which do you guys think is the female here, and which do you think is the male? That's uh, Lower is? Female. That's right, exactly. So it's fairly evident. Subtle, but yeah, she's bigger. It's great. Um, I have a timer going on my computer that I can't see. So actually, could I request that? Can you give me a heads up when I have like 10 minutes left or something? What's that? Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, so I want to back up a little, talk about our, our, our human relationship with hawks. Um, I mentioned earlier Hawk Mountain, Pennsylvania, which of course has hawks. Uh, it's a few hours west of here. I'll be leading a day trip out there in October if anybody wants to come. Um, here's their original sign. They still have it there. Um, this, I believe, is from the 20s? Um, yeah, you, it's more than 15 cents now, yeah. Um, I think it's $18, but yeah. September, October, November, that's the fall migration, and for whatever reason, fall migration concentrates the birds more. Spring migration, they're more spread out, dispersed. Fall migration, they tend to follow very specific mountains, um, and they follow these ridges, they catch updrafts of air, and they're flying along. It's like they're surfing on this air. Um, Prior to this being a hawk sanctuary, this was a favorite hawk shooting spot. So, yeah, in the late 18 and early 1900s, uh, guys, uh, mostly guys, would, would go and line up on these, on these ridges, on these cliffs, with their guns, and just shoot, shoot, shoot all day for weeks, for months. And they, uh, there's photographs. I didn't actually include them in here because I didn't want to depress everybody. <laughs> but I'll just tell you about it. Um, you know, where, where guys with their guns would line up, uh, and they would look kind of like me, they have little caps and tweet and whatnot, and they, um, they would line up next to all their, their kill. You know, there'd be hundreds of hawks spread out from a day. It was crazy. Um, but you know, this was a much more agrarian society then. I mean, it's easy from today's perspective to judge and say that was terrible, but hawks were considered a menace. Uh, it was, people tended to anthropomorphize wildlife at the time, and Audubon himself, when he wrote about, oh, by the way, that picture I had earlier of the hawks fighting over the rabbit, that was an Audubon watercolor, beautiful Audubon watercolor. He was a conservationist of his time. He lamented the excessive shooting of certain birds, but at the same time, he would write about the rapacious and bloodthirsty hawk and how they were vicious or how they were, you know, cruel. Um, and those type of terms were often used in the 19th century to describe wildlife, uh, particularly predators. And there were bounties on them. And also, since it was an agrarian society, lots of people had home small farms, lots of people had chickens. And it was upsetting if you had, you know, a dozen chickens that supplied all your eggs, and a hawk wiped them out one by one over the summer to feed their young. Um, a common colloquial name for the red tail hawk and the cooper's hawk was chicken hawk. Mm. So... I kind of understand why people did that. I, I don't condone it, but it, it's not, you know, it wasn't crazy. Did they eat them? No. 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 They weren't considered good eating. Um, I, I'm sure somebody, I'm sure people did eat them when they were hungry, but it wasn't. They weren't considered a game bird. They were killing them because it was for fun, uh, for sport. And, I mean, people still shoot, you know, lots of things for sport. Um, 
duck hunters, uh, it's some for food, but there's a lot of sea ducks that are fishy, they don't taste good. Hunters still go out now, it, like, there's, there's, yeah, you can still hunt lots of things, and it's not always for food. Um, it's, it's weird, but it's a cultural thing. So it was for sport and because they were considered pests, because they were considered uh, predators, and they were considered bad for the environment. It's the crazy thing. Now we know that predators, you know, pick off the weak and the sick and this and that, but that, that wasn't really a concept at the time. They were just considered that they were predating on your desirable species, like game birds, like pheasants and quail, to say nothing of your domestic chickens. So, um, but happily, there was a, a, a woman who used to, uh, who was a, a local person who lamented this, and she started, you know, uh, saying that the hawks are actually useful for the reasons that we now discuss, like that they remove sick and the weak and that they're declining, and, um, and she uh, really changed people's uh, minds. And then there was some early ornithologists who went there, and they recognized the importance of this as a migratory point, and it became a sanctuary, and it is to this day, and it really helped change public opinion about hawks. So that's kind of where it all started, I would say in the 1920s and 30s. Um, so I highly recommend visiting, maybe with me, <laughs> but you can... Oh yeah, I cut it off. I think Steubenville, okay. I believe, is what that says. Um, it's Hawk Mountain Road. I mean, now you know it's known, but I guess the town is not actually Hawk Mountain. It's Brewersville. Or is that it? Brewersville. Thanks. It shows what I know. I drive there every year, and I, I just I'm like, oh, Hawk Mountain. Um, yeah, and again, you can see like for the preservation of all wildlife, like that was a revolutionary concept at the time. That's actually a golden eagle, incidentally, on the sign because at the time it was thought we didn't have golden eagles in the east. And they, the ornithologist who was counting instead of shooting, saw a golden eagle, and people thought he was crazy, and he proved it. I guess cameras were just coming around, and he was able to photo document them. It was the first time they were shown to be in the east. We now know they nest in small numbers in Quebec, and they do migrate through to Appalachia. And so you can, I've seen golden eagles at Hawk Mountain. But I digress. We don't care about eagles. <laughs> Let's get back to Red Hill Hawks and back to New York City. There we are. All right, so it all kind of started in New York City with one particular red-tailed hawk. <laughs> yeah. Dun, 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 dun. I, I wish there was audio. I saw there was no audio because I really wanted there to be a hawk scream, you know, a uh, wait, wait a minute. I just had an idea. Sorry. Um, oh, good. It's only seven. I've got tons of time to mess around on my phone. Let's see here. This is going to be so worth it. Just, oh, yes. Bear with me. Bear with me. This is going to just totally, really... I wish I thought of this earlier. Where is it? Where is it? Red-tailed hawk. There it is. Huh? Red-tailed hawk. Okay. Wait, I turned off my phone earlier because I, I followed instructions. Okay, here we go. Let me back up. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> <laughs> There we go. All right, that was pretty dramatic, right? <laughs> kind of anticlimactic. Oh, my volume is down. <laughs> All right. Incidentally, if okay, stop. <laughs> if, uh, I don't know if any of you like going to the movies. I do, but as a bird watcher, it's kind of hard to enjoy them sometimes because you'll be watching a movie that takes place in Japan and you'll hear over oh, Africa and you'll hear a bird that you know is in California singing. <laughs> or you'll see a bald eagle or a vulture circling over, you know, the person in the desert or whatever and you always hear that red-tailed hawk, Kyaar! They use it as the, the call for every bird of prey. Um, so just listen for that. If you ever see a bald eagle, like the opening of the Colbert Report, when the bald eagle comes in, it's a red tail hawk call. I just want to point that out. Bald eagles sound like goldfinches. They have the wimpiest little calls. They go like... <laughs> and it's just not, mm, you know? Uh, but the, the red tail hawk sounds powerful and ferocious. Anyway, pale male uh, came screaming into New York City uh, circa uh, 1991. He was a one-year-old. He was a yearling hawk, we know, because he had the pale eyes and the pale tail, and in, in fact, uh, an exceptionally pale tail in his case. Um, that's a little oh. pixelated, sorry about that. Um, so pale male is unique uh, for a number of reasons, um, one of which is that he's just an unusually pale uh, hawk. Um, you, you, you can't generally tell one red tail from another. You can tell it's a red tail, because the red tail and the potato patches, blah, 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 but um, you can't usually tell one from the other. Um, uh, unless they're banded, but he didn't have a band on his leg or any other, you know, human-imposed identifying feature. But he was exceptionally pale. He had an almost white crown and a very pale, pinkish-red tail. So he was kind of unique. 
and he was, was noted almost immediately, uh, this yearling hawk in Central Park. And he, uh, the, 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 the virile, uh, uh, exceptional hawk he is, he found a mate when he was only two, which he's still technically an immature. And usually uh, red-tailed hawks don't find a mate until they're fully adult with the red tail and the whole thing. But he, he found, um, found a mate, and he tried to nest in a tree, but he got chased out by crows. So he and his mate nested on a building, which um, was unprecedented at the time. Ah, <laughs> we just love hawks. Yeah. Um, they're so pretty. Um, I think this is actually Pale Male and Lola. I couldn't yes. find. Um, he's actually had a bunch of uh, mates. It's kind of a, a saga. You know, I was thinking again of, of what drives us to observe these hawks, and I feel like, no offense, but I feel like the impulse in hawk oh, cam watching or observing these specific birds, it's more akin to watching a soap opera <laughs> than it is to a scientific pursuit. And that's not a judgment, it's just an observation. <laughs> and he in particular, Bill Mail, is he's just, it's like, it's like, you know, uh, I don't know, I don't know much about soap operas, but it's like some guy in some soap opera where he has a lot of uh, women in his life. Um, <laughs> So, first love was his first uh, love, and, and uh, she must have seen something in him, because he was this young bird, he was only two, she was an adult, um, so that was kind of crazy. Uh, they nested together in 1992 on, on a building by Central Park, uh, and then she mysteriously disappeared. Uh, Chocolate was his second mate, so named because she had fairly dark plumage. Uh, 93 to 95, uh, and then uh, she ate a poisoned rat uh, and died. Oh. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that more. Uh, for, oh yeah, first love was hit by a car. Uh, she was hit by a car, uh, on a, I believe it was in one of the Central Park Traverse Roads. She was brought to uh, Wild Birds Unlimited to get rehabilitated. So it wasn't Pale Nail's you know, fault that he moved on. He, 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 he moved on. Then he met Chocolate, then Chocolate ate a poison rat. First love was released, she was rehabilitated, she came back. I kind of wonder, you know, Maybe she had something to do with that rat. I'm just, I don't know. I don't have proof. I don't have proof, but it's a little it's a strange, strange coincidence. Anyway, so they, they were reunited and they nested together again, which is pretty remarkable. Normally, red tail hawks mate for life. Um, and that lifespan is typically about 20 years in the wild. They've lived up to 32, I think, in captivity. Um, and nor if, if they both lived the whole, you know, their natural life, they would spend it together. Um, New York City is full of challenges, which I'm going to get a little more into later. Um, so, so there's been a number. That's why, that's why the, 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 there's been so many. Um, so first love came back. Uh, then she disappeared under mysterious circumstances in 1997. Uh, then he found Blue in 98. They uh, nested together for three seasons. Uh, then the sort of classic era... Pale male was sort of a scion at this point of many generations of, of young hawks, which are called Iasses, little Iasses. Um, Lola, from 2002 to 2010, uh, immortalized in this book here uh, by Marie Wynn, Red Tails in Love. Uh, wonderful, wonderful book. If you haven't read it, and I'm sure most of you have, Marie Wynn uh, is actually the, the person who coined the name Pale Male. She named him. She's a writer and, and wonderful naturalist, uh, spends a lot of time in Central Park. Um, there was a documentary film about uh, Pale Male and Lola, uh, so they were real real stars. And of course, they gained, they skyrocketed to fame when they, they were evicted, as it were. Their nest, I'm sure you all know this, was, was taken off of a building um, where Mary Tyler Moore lived, and she w went to their, their, you know, their, their side, and there was whole rallies, and New York City Audubon membership, incidentally, just about doubled at that time, so thanks, building, uh, you know, condo, whatever they were, board, uh, that really worked out well for us. Um, and then Lola uh, disappeared um, in 2011, and then there was, some people call her Ginger, some call her Lima, I don't know, there's like some naming arguments happening now, but um, I guess now that it's not just Marie, when naming the birds, um, to 2011, uh, and then Ginger slash Lima ate a, a, a poisoned rat, I think. Oh, I think Blue was found dead out by the New Jersey Turnpike, um, and then and then there was then there's Zena, who's uh, 2012 to no 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 Zena was only for 2012 that was short lived, and then Octavia the eighth the eighth uh, 2013 to present. 
So, if he showed up and he was a year old in 1991, pale male would now be, uh, can we do the math here, 24? Uh, 25, 25, yes, he was a year old then. 25 years old. Now, the, the, the oldest recorded captive red tail is 32. I think the oldest recorded wild red tail is 27. There was a controversial blog post on the blog, a Corey Fingers blog, 10,000 Birds, recently, uh, called uh, Pale Male is Dead, Long Live Pale Male. I don't know if any of you saw that. Uh -huh. Well, I, I thought that might stoke, uh, inflame passions in the audience, but I thought I'd bring it up. I'm agnostic. Why is that? Photo evidence? Every day, yes. He said you can tell what the, who the bird is by the seer. Oh. Ooh. Thank you. I like that. The seer, C-E-R-E, which is the fleshy uh, base of the bill where the nostrils are. It's bright yellow on most hawks, so you've got the black beak and then the seer. C-E-R-E. And parrots and falcons also have seers. Another hint that they might be related. Um, so yeah, apparent, uh, but I don't know how a little yellow bit of flesh with some nostrils in it is diagnostic, but if you've been photographing them every day for 25 years, then maybe you can tell. I don't know. Um, I, like I said, I'm agnostic, but I, Corey just pointed out, is it, is it an unlikely that the m most famous hawk in the world will also be the longest lived hawk in the world? That's especially considering that eight of his mates have died under mysterious circumstances. <laughs> Seems improbable, but I don't know. It could, it could be. And his question in the blog was, when will people except that maybe it's not the same bird, like, in a few more years, let's say he outlives the longest-lived captive hawk ever, let's say he's 37, are we going to say it's probably not the same bird, maybe it's one of his kids who looks very similar, I don't know. I lean towards thinking Corey's right, but uh, I don't want to lose the audience here, so I'm just going to say, I don't know, I don't know, who can say? He's not banded. We could have laid all this to rest years ago by just banding him, but uh, we didn't do that. But I was told by, uh, not to talk so much about pale male because, you know, he's, 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 he's been talked about a lot. So I'm going to move on here. Enough about pale male. <laughs> oh, just one more amazing shot of pale male. He's so great. Just so great. Look at that. Isn't that dramatic? There's, you can see his pale head there. Allegedly pale male. Maybe pale male junior. Um, speaking of pale male junior, there is a pale male junior. Uh, and pale male himself, you know, is really important because he founded this dynasty of urban hawks. All of our well, we don't know, but there weren't any hawks nesting in New York City prior to Pale Male, and now there's tons. Yeah. Are they all his descendants? Maybe, maybe not. Um, it could just be that some red tails wandering through, you know, uh, saw other hawks around, and they're like, cool, this is a good place for hawks. Or it could be that whatever shifting ecological trends allowed Pale Male to settle here uh, also allowed other hawks to settle here. Uh, maybe more trees, maybe less pollution, something like that. So you can't really say. But... What we do know is that pale male has raised uh, two to four babies annually, almost. There was a couple years in there where he was mateless uh, for 25 years. So that is, is literally uh, something shy of 100 hawks, you know. So he might have um, actually single-handedly, single-wingedly, um, uh, started this whole hawks in New York City trend, and they might be his kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. Um, I don't know. Uh, there's probably a way to do genetic analysis of that. I don't know if it's been done. I could probably do a pretty killer PhD now that I think about it. <laughs> that would be a widely read paper. Well, anyway. Ah, uh, yes, there he is. One more. Okay, last pale male shot, I swear. Uh, that's just going to be... We'll leave that up for a little while here. Um, so as of 2009, this is the last data I could find. That's six years ago. I don't know why I couldn't find more recent data, and you guys might have it. Um, there were 35 known pairs of red tails nesting in New York City. So that's, uh, sorry, I keep doing that. 35 known pairs of red tails. So that's 70 adult hawks plus all of their young. That's incredible uh, in such a, a dense urban setting. I mean, we're one of the densest cities in the world. Um, I, and again, I, I feel like hawks inspire us more than many other birds because they're clearly really a wild animal. There's something about big predators. Similar, you know, to wolves or bobcats. They're sort of the wolves of the bird world, I guess. Um, incidentally, you know how we were all sad talking about the history of hawks and how they used to be hunted because they were considered bad because they were predators? In the mammalian realm, that's still the case. There's still a, a federal bounty on coyotes, which are very parallel to red-tailed hawks in how they've expanded and thrived 
and they're actually arriving in New York City now, and no doubt soon we'll have them raising some pups on the side of a building somewhere on the Upper East Side. Um, they, are, they do show up in Central Park periodically. They keep turning up, and we keep, uh, 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 what is it, um, tranquilizing them, and then sending them back upstate uh, as fast as they can turn up here, or to the Bronx, yes? Yeah, really? Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. Boy, Stuyvesant Town's really, uh, I think there was a wild turkey that turned up there, there was that very thrush. Stuytown's really great for the wildlife, yeah. There was just a piece in the New York Times saying that the official policy of forest rangers in New York is to leave them be. Oh, that's great. Did you repeat that? The official policy now is to leave them be. That's news to me, because there was one that the police tranquilized yes. uh, on the Lower East Side about a month ago. Um, but that was the NYPD, not the uh, Parks Department. I'm not going to get into NYPD shooting uh, anything. Uh, <laughs> there. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, they, that, that, that animal was, it was tranquilized. It wasn't shot. Um, it was shot with a you know, tranquilizer dart and then sent up to the Bronx, I think. I have seen coyotes on Staten Island and at um, a, a large botanical garden in the Bronx that prefers not to be associated with coyotes. Um, <laughs> And also at a smaller cultural institution in the Bronx that rhymes with pave pill. Um, I don't know. Um, that also doesn't want to be associated with coyotes, but there's a, there's a coyote who hangs out there pretty regularly. Um, don't, don't tell them I told you that. Uh, and out at Staten Island, it's amazing. And so obviously you're, you're just general large predator fans. That's great. I like to see that. And I hope our attitudes about mammalian predators evolve the way they have with avian predators. Um, again, still a bounty. We still have certain, you know, uh, presidential hopefuls from Alaska uh, uh, boasting about shooting them from helicopters with semi-automatic weapons. So um, we have a little catching up to do on that front. Back to hawks. Um, Amazing symbols of the wild that they are. We have a whole bunch of them here. It's exciting. Uh, I, I suspect the numbers must have only gone up since 2009. So 35 and 09, who knows now, it's probably 40 plus. Um, so uh, getting more local here, we have the Washington Square Park Hawks. Um, Bobby and Violet, I think, were the uh, original pair. Um, Bobby, so named for the Bobst Library, upon which they built their nest. Uh, and, you know, much like Pale Male and Lola had sort of Tony taste and they, 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 they built their nest on a really nice uh, uh, apartment tower on the Upper East Side, these guys chose to build their nest right outside uh, uh, the, the window of, of Sexton, uh, the, the president of NYU. Um, so they, uh, they, they, they know what they're doing, these hawks. Um, and again, Bobby's a survivor. His lady friends don't seem to do quite as well. I, I suspect there's something about female hawk behavior that, lead, that puts them in harm's way more often. Um, I, I don't mean to make light of it. I mean, I clearly do mean to make light of it, but it's also somewhat tragic. Um, but that would be another interesting area of study. Why do the females, why do the males outlast the females? Maybe the females are doing more of the hunting, but the males still have to eat. So if she eats a poison rat, he would also, one presume, be exposed to poison rats. Um, so the, it's not all poison rats, though. A lot of, a lot of them die from collisions, uh, car accidents, or hitting buildings. Um, in more rural or suburban areas, they often get tangled in power lines. That's at least something they don't have to worry about here so much. Um, so there's a number of, you know, of threats or challenges in, in a hawk in a man-made or altered environment. Uh, anyway, so Violet um, didn't last, and then there was Rose, and then I believe now it is Sadie. Um, I don't know the exact chronology of these, which is why I didn't put the years there. I'm sure there's somebody here does. Um, so that's uh, something to uh, uh, remind me of your name again. I'm sorry. Uh, Jeannie. Jeannie. Her name is actually Aurora. Oh, no. So who was, it was the Sadie I was reading about? There you go. See? Her name's Aurora, and this random blogger's calling her Sadie. I hope you're not here, random blogger. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. I'm sorry. See, again, I'm more of a hawk generalist. I don't get quite into the specifics of their names. I don't even speak hawk, so like, uh, I just all sounds like, Yar! to me, so I don't know if she's saying, hi, I'm Rosie, or hi, I'm saying. Um... So, uh, so wait, what's Sadie's actual name? Aurora. Aurora. Why didn't they stick with the color convention? We had Violet, we had Rosie, why couldn't we have... I don't know. Anyway, if I... I'm not in charge. Okay. Oh, you're, you're right, there was a committee. And, uh, tell, tell me your name again? Jeannie. Jeannie, and you're the... I don't have a club, the NYU Hawk Club. You're, you're the president of the NYU Hawk Club? I'm the moderator of the chat 
Okay, oh, okay, great. So, if, and that's, you, you focus on Washington Square Park, uh, NYU Hawks only. So, we have the actual expert in-house here, and again, I don't profess. So, uh, so talk to Jeannie uh, afterwards if you want to really get the scoop on these Hawks. But they, of course, um, really, uh, I guess it was, it was back in the Violet era, I think. Maybe it was Rosie. I should know that. No, it was Violet. When, um, oh, did I go backwards? when they uh, became known and beloved to the world, and maybe almost equaled Pale Male and Lola in, in fame, uh, when they were featured on a New York Times uh, webcam. Um, and, and so people, all, you know, a lot of people check out the New York Times website, so people all over were able to follow these hawks raising a boo and scout, were they, I believe? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, and so boo and scout were Bobby and Rosie's? That's okay, right, right, right. I'm, just, I'm bad with names anyway, like even people names are not so great, so bear with me. Um, Pip's pretty cute, because that's, the Pip is the term for when they crack the egg with the little egg tooth in their beak, that's pretty good. I don't know where Boone Scout came from, but I'm sure there's some reason. Oh, that makes sense. Which is misleading, because, you know, red tail hawks really don't do that. Mockingbirds are kind of small for a red tail hawk, so that's... Oh, okay, that's great. Uh, no, uh, pipping is the verb for actually cracking the egg. They're called iasses. E y a s s. E y e s s. A s s. Yeah. Huh? It's a face only a mother could love. No, it's pretty, pretty cute. I think that's scout. I believe. And then, of course, over in Tompkins Square Park. Uh, we have Christo and Dora. I know where their names come from, at least. Uh, I have read To Kill Mockingbird. It's been years. I just had a moment. Um, for Christo Dora, the building that they actually built their nest on. Um, so that's a, that's a naming convention I can get behind. Um, another beautiful photo, courtesy of Laura Gaga. Thank you. Um, uh, and again, I think we've got um, uh, Dora here on the right, presumably. Looks bigger. And Christo on the left. Is it Chris or Christo? Christo, right? Like the, not to be confused with the guy who covers everything in cloth. <laughs> and they have a webcam. Um, the local, the Washington Square Heart Hawks don't have webcam, a webcam at the moment, so you'll just have to just go to the next park over and follow those hawks. Um, this was from early, just before, you know, just before I left my house. I checked out the webcam and took the screenshot. Um, you can sort of see at the bottom there the head moving, and it's very windy. You can see the feathers kind of blowing. Uh, not such a great view of the Hawks, but a great view of the church and uh, the bridge in the distance there. So I guess we're looking uh, east, presumably. Where are they nesting? Um, I don't actually know what building this is. It's a it's a, an apartment tower, I think. I go off. You guys would know. That's great. Yes. Well, so what happened with Christadora is uh, they were also on an air conditioner there, I believe. They are partial to air conditioners. They're a nice projecting surface. Um, and uh, Christadora, I think, has to repoint the building or do some kind of construction. So they had to remove the nest, but it wasn't quite as bad as when Pale Male and Lola's were was removed strictly for aesthetic reasons. This, you know, they didn't want the hawks to get hurt, so they took the nest off, and then the hawks started rebuilding. And then they put, I think, pigeon spikes, and the hawks kept building. And then they put plexiglass to make a smooth surface, I guess, that it could be hard to keep a stick on. Uh, and that seemed to do the trick, so they finally got the idea. But they kept trying to build there. And they finally moved over to an apartment building nearby, so that's good. And again, they frequent Tompkins Square Park. And it's pretty cool. Uh, I guess they started probably building their nest about a month ago now, I think mid-February. You can see them breaking sticks in trees. And again, that's all documented on Laura's blog, so you should go see that. Uh, all these images. Of sti not just sticks, though. They'll pick up plastic bags, and they'll bring you know random pieces of garbage, and uh, all different things to, to, to decorate and build the nest. It's pretty cool. Um, and again, this is pretty remarkable, you know, building their nests on air conditioning units, on buildings, because they're generally a tree nester. Uh, you know, I mentioned they're in all those different habitats in deserts, in the Great Plains. I think even in the Great Plains, they seek out um, riparian river areas where you do have some tree growth, or in deserts for that matter, you have more trees along rivers. Um, I don't think they usually would build a nest on the ground, uh, and I don't think they usually build their nests on cliffs. Peregrine falcons are almost exclusively cliff nesters. So for them, it makes sense to nest in a, in a city, really, because these buildings are like man-made cliffs. Um, but a building's very different from a tree. So that's why it's pretty neat that all these birds have started 
shifting to buildings because there's more buildings than trees around, I guess. But they still break off all these sticks, so they still have that, that tree need. Whereas the peregrine falcon does not make a nest at all, actually. Peregrine falcons, because they you know, nest in the Arctic, where you don't have red-tailed hawks, areas where you have no trees, um, they just do what's called a scrape. The peregrine falcon will just lay its egg on a bare rock surface or building ledge, as the case may be. So, um, so uh, some... How am I doing that time, by the way? Ten minutes? Perfect. Okay. Um, some threats to New York City red tails. Uh, so we have this, so, so okay. um, I, you know, I, I just, uh, again, because there's such expertise in the room, and these birds are so well documented on blogs on, in the New York Times, I, I felt uh, unprepared in certain ways to get into the, well, the whole stories of, of these individual hawks, but there's a, luckily a wonderful wealth of information out there about them. Um, and they're incredibly well documented from their very first nesting attempts on and all the young that they've raised and so on. Um, and uh, it's really, I think, unique actually uh, and unprecedented the individual attention paid to these birds and the way that we've documented their lives and their families uh, and successes and tragedies. And I think it's a really fascinating cultural phenomenon. Um, and uh, yeah, so 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 that's basically why I didn't get into more specifics about these individual birds, um, just because there's so much such a wealth of information out there. I just couldn't even fit it into the framework of this talk or the time frame of this talk. But I encourage you to go check out the blogs and the webcams and stuff. And I'm sure a lot of you already do anyway. And again, we have some wonderful experts right here in the room. Um, so for all the red tail hawks in New York City, although they are they are increasing, they are flourishing. There's still threats, you know. I we we heard about all of you know pale males tragic, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, relationships. I mean, although one does suspect foul play. Oh. <laughs> uh, oops. Oh, see, okay, yeah, I'm done. No, that's it. Yeah. Um. So, not directly threatening to anybody, really, but. Um, one prey item, and of course the, the primary prey item uh, for red tail hawks is the delicious uh, Norway rat or New York City uh, street rat, subway rat. Um, interestingly, these are both, uh, that of course is a pigeon there, I think you all probably, some of you mentioned your bird watchers, so you know that. Um, rock doves, rock pigeons, and the Norway rat are both uh, introduced invasive species. These are both European animals that were brought over by Europeans. So these aren't even food sources that red tail hawks would have historically been eating when they evolved. Um, however, uh, they do also, they're quite partial to squirrel. Um, gray squirrels are a common prey item in New York City parks, and those are native. Gray squirrels, it might be hard to believe because they're just almost, they seem as abundant as rats, but they're actually a native species that has flourished in the city as well. Um, so yeah, medium-sized rat, uh, rodents, um, and then also, as in the Audubon painting, uh, cottontail rabbits, which aren't as common anymore, but you do have them around the city, out at like Jamaica Bay. Um, I think there's some in Prospect Park. I saw a red tail take down a cottontail once there. It was pretty cool. Um, yeah, dramatic. Um, um, but yeah, so these, these are, these are non-native species that have really flourished in the city. So one of the reasons red tails are great is because they're actually helping control what are basically pests. You know, rats are definitely a pest. Pigeons, you know, they're not really a pest, but there's an awful lot of them. We won't miss a few. Um, but the downside to having these as prey items um, is that they often are species that humans try to control. And for pigeons, it tends to be more through environmental modifications like pigeon spikes and reducing their nesting or perching sites. Uh, for rats, the, still the primary means of controlling their numbers is poison. Um, they've altered the types of poisons used a little bit. It used to be more indiscriminate spreading of poison. Now they tend to put poison pellets in their burrows. So at the, at the very least, other animals won't encounter the poison. Or you might see those little fake rocks. Have you ever noticed around certain parks, these gray plastic rocks? They're actually little rat motels, and they have poison inside them. The rats go inside. The idea there being that someone's little dog won't eat the poison or something like that. So that's all well and good for other rat-sized animals that might eat the poison like a cat or a dog or some other wildlife, a squirrel. However, um, these rodenticides will build up in the rat's body, and if uh, you have an apex predator, like a red-tailed hawk, 
it will ingest those poisons as well. Um, I think part of the, the idea of the science behind it is, is that they've in, created poisons that act more and more quickly so that the rat has less time to be out running around and being a potential prey item. But unfortunately, a, a rat that is poisoned is actually a, a more likely prey item almost because it's, yeah, it's discombobulated, it's, it's slow, so it's almost more likely to be caught. So um, that's a tricky thing. Um, New York City Audubon, with whom I'm, I'm affiliated, um, I lead tours and classes for, um, have, a, have had a campaign to try to work with the Parks Department to at least not put out rodenticides during the breeding season so that the young hawks aren't being exposed to the rat poison. Um, but I, I don't think the Parks Department has really taken up the idea of not using rat poison at all. And certainly the MTA puts out tons of rat poison. Um, those rats maybe don't ever make it up to the surface. I think there's rats that can spend their entire rat lives down in the subways and be perfectly content down there. So they might never see a red tail hawk. Um, so maybe that's a non-issue, but certainly the ones in the parks. Um, and I don't really know what a good solution is. I mean, we don't want rats everywhere. Nobody does. Um, I think the general thought among the anti-rat poison folks, such as myself, is, is to have fewer rats by having fewer food sources. So instead of having open-type trash cans, having... You know, in other cities, there's these amazing trash cans that um, are solar-powered, and they actually compact garbage, and they have a, a flap that is rat-proof that you have to put the trash through. It's got these little flaps and you push the things through. Um, it's brilliant, yeah, and they compact the trash so they can hold a lot more as well. And I don't know why New York City, huge city, huge budget, oh, you know why? Okay, great. Tompkins Square Park has some now. They're oh! They cost $5,000 each. That might be why. <laughs> so it's, it's, been, it's been slow, but they're slowly replacing $5,000 each, wow. Oh. Hmm. So, well, Philadelphia has a way smaller budget than we do. We should be able to make that. Us look bad. Anyway, um, well, well. Uh, so, 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 so that's one thing. You could all um, take a page from Philadelphia's book and, you know, work on the New York Pride a little bit and start writing maybe letters to De Blasio saying, "Hey, if Philadelphia can do this. I mean, I think we should be able to do it." So yeah, solar-powered, uh, compacting, rat-proof trash cans. I think would be one step to reducing uh, the rat population and thus the need for poison. However, fewer rats would also mean less hawk food. So it might actually the population might naturally decline because there would be fewer prey items. So I, I don't know. You know, they wouldn't be dying tragic deaths, but there's less food, abundant food. I don't know. It's a tricky thing. I don't have an answer. I just wanted to bring it up as an issue. Yeah. An interesting thing is, is the woman that leads the gardening projects down in Battery Lake Park um, works with people who, I'm not exactly sure where her information comes from, but in discussions with her, she said that actually the rat population, when it's poisoned, actually increases. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because the more rats that are dying from poison, the rats produce more offspring <coughs> during, during that period when they're being poisoned. So it actually has Like they somehow sense population. it and they... Interesting. They have more offspring. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I prefer bird to rat. <laughs> And of course, uh, you know, there's a, he's expensive, but there's the, uh, we could always get the Pied Piper and uh, <laughs> lead him out to the Hudson. That's what I think we should do. Um, but he charges a lot. Oh, they can swim. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, rats are amazing survivors, and I don't know that any poisoning, poisoning regimen actually will, you know, keep their population maybe reduced, but maybe not. Like you say, it might change their breeding behavior. Interesting. So your theory about the hawks is that we're breeding generations of bird-eating hawks because the hawks that like to catch rats die, so it's sort of a natural selection, if you will, or a slightly unnatural selection. Which is not what we want, because some of them eat birds. Yeah, robins, cardinals. Flickers, I've seen them eating. Really? Wow, a warbler's like a tiny little, little tiny snack for a red-tailed hawk. A warbler, they pick their teeth with a warbler. That's that's really not a meal for a red-tailed hawk. I don't know. Um, anyway, so we have some work to do on that front. That being said, I, and, and again, I, I know when you watch these hawks, you know, day in and day out, like you go and observe their nest in person, or you watch the webcams, you get very personally invested in those birds, and it's really heartbreaking if you see a little hawk, you know, a little pip or scout or whomever raised from a little ias to a, a juvenile hawk, and then maybe they have babies their own, and then they eat a poisoned rat and die or whatever. That's hard. Um, it's also it's important, though, to keep in mind that red tails are increasing. So in spite of these deaths, in spite of the poison, their numbers are going up uh, nationally and locally. So they're doing fine. Um, it would be great to not have senseless and needless deaths, um, but I would also, you know, try to keep in mind the sort of the bless you the big picture. Um, and there are many birds that really need our energies and our voices that are unsung. Uh, and um, the most rapidly declining bird in North America is the rusty blackbird, and we're not watching those on webcams, and you know. Um, I don't know that there's any easy solution. I don't know what steps we can take to save the rusty back blackbird. They breed in uh, sphagnum bogs up in Canada and uh, the Adirondacks in northern New England. And I'm not, you know, it could be climate change related. Uh, could be deforestation of boreal forests um, for paper products. That's something we could do something about. But um, there's a lot of challenges. You know, a much bigger threat nationally to birds than anything else is cats. Um, so, you know, in New York City, we're pretty, we're pretty like, we don't have that blood in our hands because not so many people have outdoor house cats here. Um, but in suburban and rural areas, that's a huge issue. And then in New York, it's collisions. It's the number one threat to birds overall is collisions with buildings. And New York City Audubon, to that end, has a project called Project Safe Flight, where we work with buildings to try to use less reflective glass. Um, we have a program called Lights Out New York to have skyscrapers turn their lights off during the migratory season at night because those disorient migrating birds. Uh, there was a wonderful photo on your blog, Laura, of an uh, American woodcock that had presumably hit a window. They are the number two most frequent collision victim in New York City. White-throated sparrow is number one. Red-tailed hawks occasionally fall victim to collisions, not as much because they're resident and they're wily and they learn about buildings and they grew up on buildings, so they kind of know. It's some young, you know, white-throated sparrow that was born last spring up in the Adirondacks that's flying through here in the fall that's like, whoa, cool, look at all that, ooh, you know, whack. Um, because it's naive and uh, doesn't well, know. Well, uh, you just you, you used an adjective for the glass that's safer. What did you, what did you say? I think it says less reflective. Less reflective, well, less reflective less is reflective. all. Um, there's, there's different techniques for that. There's a glass being made in Germany that actually has um, uh, hidden, uh, rather, fibers that reflect um, UV light. Birds can see in the UV range and we can't. Um, so they see these patterns in the glass, and we don't, so it looks clear to us. It's expensive, though. You can uh, fritter, I think is the word, the glass. You can put dots and textures. Um, there was recently a, an overhaul of the Javits Center, which was one of the number one culprits. It was, you know, it's this huge glassy cube. Um, birds were just flying into it all day. And New York City Audubon partnered with the architects uh, who redid the Javits Center and re reduced bird collisions by like 80%. Uh, yeah, it, they put on metal, they patterned the glass that was still there, uh, the bird was more visible. Um, and it's also way more eco-friendly now because it was like a big greenhouse before, so it's easier to cool and easier to heat, and it's just great. Uh, and they put on green roofs that are reducing runoff, and there's now colonies of gulls, and there's kestrels in nest boxes, and all these birds nesting on the green roofs. Uh, it's exciting. Um, but I'm not talking about hawks. I apologize. Um, uh, but yeah, I just, I just, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I, I don't want to say, you know, not to pour your passions into these birds. But I would say, just keep in mind that overall, red-tailed hawks are the most abundant raptor in North America. They're doing great. They are not threatened in any way. Even the local populations that sometimes succumb to these threats are actually robust and increasing. So. Uh, 
take some of that passion, please, and if you don't already, try to find out what birds are actually declining globally or locally, and which ones are really threatened, and use some of those energies to also be a voice for those birds that maybe don't have a voice, because red-tailed hawks are so charismatic and so widely known, uh, but they don't really need us as much as some other species. So I'm just going to put that little plug in there. Um, <laughs> and uh, I thought I would leave it there, uh, but red tail hawks are still wonderful because they they connect us again with this something wild, and it's amazing to be walking in midtown Manhattan and have a, have an, uh, an encounter with a predator like this. This photograph is by a photographer named Chris Fargo. I don't know if he's in the room or not. Um, incredible shot. This is in Central Park. Yeah, uh, that's is that an adult or an immature hawk? Anybody know? Right, very good. So yeah, incredible image um, of a really wild, yes, who knows, I'm going to leave it there. Um, thank you so much.